All right, y'all, here we go, here we go, man. And I had, I'm gonna go on a little bit of a rant right here for a second because I had this big cinematic 30 minute uh, way too early NBA Wards prediction video ready to launch yesterday. And for whatever reason, I have some new plugins or whatever it may be, it literally crashed like right when I was finalizing it. As far as like, I was, I was done, I was done, crashed. Oh, backups corrupt. Long story short, I couldn't recover any of what I did. And I spent a good two, three hours just feeling sorry for myself. And I kind of, I don't know how many of you guys can relate. I kind of feel like an asshole sometimes when something small like that happens and I really feel bad for myself. I'm like, man, stop being a punk, man. You know what I'm saying? In the grand scheme of things relative to what's going on in the world, it's nothing, right? But I think we all, in our own little worlds, when something something small happens, it's it's annoying and it can piss you off, right? It's like the end of the world, and you feel real, you feel like a real victim for a couple of hours, man. But it's important to shake it off. So I dusted myself off, and here we are, Thursday morning. I'm gonna change it up a little bit. I really, you know, for, for me, I have a hard time trying to recreate something. It's always that first take that I'm looking for. You guys know I don't do a lot of editing with my takes. I give you a first take and that's what it is. Um, so anyway, I'm cutting this one a little different because this is gonna be more of the format this season. I'm gonna be covering more of the league and bits and pieces and then of course my extended warriors coverage you know where to find that on patreon so i'm cutting off some of these awards that are eh, coach of the year most improved maybe we'll talk about that later i'm going to go to the three main ones being rookie of the year defensive player of the year and mvp and my predictions for that now if you remember go back and check out last year's way too early predictions because some of that stuff was on point you know what I'm saying? I'm not just throwing this shit out here. This is, the, the, I, I, have, I have some thought behind this. I'm going to give you a little bit of my thoughts behind it. So we'll start with Rookie of the Year. And that's my favorite award. I don't know about y'all. I think it's the most exciting award because it's the unknown. We're still learning about these players. We don't know what their ceiling is or what their floor is. We don't know some of their traits and abilities. Where when you talk about the MVP, Defensive Player of the Year, you're talking more about established guys that have kind of more of a finished product and we know what to expect, it gets a lot more political. All these awards are political, make no mistake about it. <clears throat> so my favorite for rookie of the year is Colin Sexton, right? In Cleveland. And I think that, again, a lot of this is opportunity. And with LeBron leaving, you take a look at that roster, he's going to be handed the keys at point guard. And I think Ty Lue, uh, Mr. Gilbert, right? They really, they need another star. Kevin Love's not going to cut it for him. And I know they gave him a bag. And I think he'll be a fine pick and roll partner for young Sexton. But I think that they're going to kind of force feed him the ball and allow him to make a lot more mistakes and stay on the floor than maybe you would see from some of these other rookies. Ty Lue obviously being a point guard. So I think they're going to kind of force feed him by volume. But I don't want to take anything away from him. The dude can ball, right? You got to love his intensity, his motor, um, and just the way he plays the game. Now, the one question I have is what kind of rookie wall will he hit? If you consider, you know, that your strength is your weakness. And so his motor and his energy and intensity is going to be there from every night. But, you know, this is his first NBA season and how much they rely on him to be on ball and the volume, I'm guessing over 30 minutes a night, his wall, his rookie wall could be a lot stiffer than some of these other guys that are eased into the season and have less responsibility. Nonetheless, I think Sexton's numbers will be there. I think the highlights will be there, the personality, the swagger's there. So he's my favorite for rookie of the year. Now, my candidate, my candidate, let's see here. I got my notes out here and I know this one, I'm not, I'm not cheating, but I'm going to go DeAndre Ayton. Now I'm out here in Phoenix area and I'm excited to see these Suns. I'm not, don't, don't get it twisted. I'm not a Suns fan, but I like to see good basketball and I'm excited for the fans here locally because I think they finally can be excited. I think they can finally feel excited about the potential of this team. Josh Jackson towards the end of last season finally looked like what we expected him to look like, right? Book, obviously the hand surgery could be concerning in the shooting hand, but you know, with today's sports science, you got to assume he'll come back. And then obviously the number one pick, DeAndre Ayton. I love Mikel Bridges. I love that trade. I think Philly fucked up. 
I think Philly fucked up. That remains to be seen, but that was a shocking trade, and I thought Phoenix got over with a 3 and D wing to add with the veteran Trevor Ariza, Ryan Anderson. Anyway, I'm not, I'm not breaking down the whole Suns team. The reason why I think DeAndre Ayton's in a similar situation where he's going to be afforded the opportunity to make mistakes and stay on the floor. You've got a great veteran behind you in Tyson Chandler who can kind of help him become a pro. And I don't think his rookie wall will be as steep because of his body and his physique. I think that's one of his uh, most appealing traits, pause, that, uh, and why he, was, he went number one. Obviously, you don't, bigs don't come along like that, but it's his, his frame and his body. He looks like he's going to be an NBA Ironman, so I don't know if he'll hit the wall. He can stretch the floor. The question will be is, because if you look at the Suns roster, is the point guard position. Is, I know Book will have the ball in his hands, but he likes to let that thing go. He's a pure scorer, so I don't know how much... Um, of his gravity will benefit Aiton, but they've brought in more shooters. And, and let's face it, he's going to wake up with 10 rebounds, right? He's going to have the rebounding will be there, and he just has a variety of ways to score. So I think the numbers will be there, and then him being the number one pick, there's going to be more eyes on him throughout the season, right? People are going to be paying attention, and that, that will work in his benefit as long as he produces the numbers. Now, my dark horse candidate, you know, and I think there's, is, is he really a dark horse? I think after Summer League, people are, are, are kind of seeing what time it is with this dude. I'm not going to front like I was really aware of him at Kentucky, but that man, Kevin Knox, right? The New York Knicks, what's the saying? Uh, Even the sun shines on a dog's ass some days, right? Shout out White Man Can't Jump, one of my favorite movies. But uh, point is, is that I'm not sure the Knicks, I keep hitting my mouse here, I'm not sure that the Knicks knew how good he was going to be, you know, I think they just may have stumbled into drafting him, but you know, of course, they never admit that, but point is that they look like they got it, they got a stud right here, and coming out of Kentucky, we've seen this plenty of times, Kentucky is so overloaded with talent that a lot of the times they get to the pros and you can really see what these dudes can do. You, they, they're kind of held back by the abundance of talent at Kentucky playing behind guys. And that looks like it's going to be the case with Knox. And, and the thing is, and, and don't, don't, um, don't get carried away with this. I'm not saying he's this yet, but everybody loves to compare Brandon Ingram to Kevin Durant, right? But the thing is, is there's a huge difference in mentality. Durant, you remember him at Texas. You remember him as a supersonic day one with uh, PJ Carlissimo just dropping 20. He has a scorer's mentality. And I don't really see that with Ingram. I think he's more of a five-tooler, a versatile guy, right? And this kid Knox has a scorer's mentality. And he reminds me a lot more of a young Durant than an Ingram and some of these other guys that have been compared to KD in the last four or five drafts, right? It's just because he's, he's long. He's got a handle, he's a, he has a pure stroke, and he just likes to score the ball. And then you take into account that KP has no return date. That's a 20 shots in that offense that Knox is going to get a piece of that pie right away. You've got Tim Hardaway Jr. is really the only other chucker on that team because Nilati Nicotina, Andre Nicotina, shout out to Bay, but Nilatina, I can't pronounce his name, the French point guard they drafted last year. You talk about mentalities. And I like him. Don't get it twisted. I like him as a versatile guard, kind of a Nicholas Batum. Maybe I'm, I'm reaching here with the French thing. But, you know, he doesn't have a scorer's mentality. He's more of a defensive player. So the point is, is he's not going to take a ton of shots. Knox, look for him to lead all rookies in scoring at least until KP gets back. He has that mentality. And then you've got to like Fizdale as the new coach. Coach, he ain't no dummy, man. He he's a legit coach, so he knows he knows. I think that what he can do with that kid's mentality and his size and shooting. So he's my dark horse for rookie of the year, um, defensive player of the year. Let me sip my coffee here. <clears throat> okay, my favorite. For the defensive player of the year, who y'all think it is? It's Kawhi Leonard. It's Kawhi Leonard. No, I don't have the laugh sound bite. I don't have the laugh sound bite. <laughs> my, my Doesn't he laugh exactly like you think he would? Right? I mean, it wasn't it, as funny as it was, and I watched it 10 times, like I'm sure all of you did. It was like, yeah, that's how he would laugh. Right? The dude in the back of the class, he makes a joke and no one laughs. And he, anyway, Kawhi. Now, this is obviously operating under the assumption that he is healthy. And I think with the way the media covers things and the publicity around him arriving in Toronto, I think we would have heard something. We would have heard something if the quad or if he still wasn't 100. 
So I'm assuming he's 100%. Now, we talked about back to mentalities and scoring mentalities. That was something that Pop and the Spurs kind of had to cultivate within Kawhi. It wasn't, it wasn't innate. He's not a natural scorer, right? But they asked him to become that as Duncan, Ginobili, and Parker aged out of, out of the Spurs, right? And so everybody has a gas tank. As amazing as Kawhi is, and I know he always plays under such control, everybody has stamina and energy that they have to portion out into different aspects of their game. And when they asked him to pick up more of the offensive load and be the initiator these last few seasons, it took a little bit away from his defensive uh, energy. You look at this Raptors roster, it's more balanced. You've got two guards that can initiate the offense in Lowry and Fred Van Vliet. Um, and you've got some shooting around him. So I don't see him having to initiate the offense as much as he did in San Antonio in those later years. And what that what that's going to do is it's going to simply leave more energy for him to activate the claw on a nightly basis. And when you talk about defensively, you know, and, and the defensive player of the year, the numbers don't always tell the story. It's very it's a very subjective category because you have to talk, think about scheme. Right. And you have to just think about it. Sometimes it's what you don't see. It's the guy that just passes the ball away or doesn't take the shot because that guy was closing out. It's not always, it's not a numbers thing. A lot of uh, younger basketball fans and players. Oh, he averaged two steals. That also means he gambles a hell of a lot, right? It doesn't necessarily mean he's a great defensive player. Take a look at Allen Iverson's career steal numbers. He gambled because he had to. He knew if he didn't get that, he was going to get pinned and scored on. And anyway, Kawhi, what sets him apart and what I've seen from him that is, you look at a Chris Paul, a Steph Curry, a Kyrie Irving, these guys that are elite ball handlers, and most defenders can't get up into them because they know that effectively it's going to unlock the handles they're going to get danced on, right? And Kawhi has the ability to make these elite ball handlers pick up their dribble and move the ball. That really, I think, separates him. We know about his versatility and then obviously his length, the ability to contest shots and those claws, those big hands. If he gets a claw on the ball, it's Rip City, right? He, it's, if he gets the hand on the ball, it's his ball. And that has to do, I think, with the size of those paws. And so he's my favorite. I think obviously he's got a ton to prove regardless if he wants to stay in Toronto or not. He wants to up his marketability, his star power, you know, from his uncle and all, whatever they're doing. Anyway, he has a lot to prove. But I, I'm, And you look at that roster, you, you expect them to be a well over 50 win team. And they've got other young defenders and a newbie and a newbie. Am I saying that right? And a newbie uh, Siakam right? They have these other wing guys and that all helps. That all helps. It makes his defense look even more impactful when the rest of the defense is sound, right? Um, so after that, we got the candidate and my candidate is going to be Draymond Green. And I know most of you are thinking like, oh, no. You look at last year and, and how he paced himself. He definitely took a step back and I think it was co he, he cognizant cognitively cognitive you see your boy's a little rusty i've been off camera for a minute he purposefully paced himself and he wasn't going as hard throughout the regular season right but if you pay attention to who draymond green is he obviously i think the warriors tried to have a a, <clears throat> a contract negotiation with him and he's like no 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 let's wait let's wait and the, if you if you've paid attention to his personality you know he wants the ultimate super bag the super max now i'm not saying he's going to get it from anybody but I still think he wants to be eligible for it, right? And the only way he can be eligible for it is there's three ways. Winning MVP, we know that's not happening. Make an all-NBA team. And, you, and, and, and people, I think people don't appreciate how difficult that is, right? At the forward position, and you have to take into account some of these youngsters that are getting better. That's very difficult. Or win Defensive Player of the Year, which he's already done. And uh, all-NBA Defensive Player of the Year, that kind of goes hand-in-hand, hand, right? I just think he has extra incentive to turn up this year and really put the clamps on from day one of the regular season. Will it be smart? Will it? Will he wear down? I mean, he's still relatively young, right? But I'm just pointing that out. I think he may try to make a statement and go after that, that second defensive player of the year award. And then I also think there's another little psychological thing. I think he will want to lead by example for Boogie Cousins. If we talk about this DeMarcus acquisition, Everybody, you know, 26 and 13, 12, all this. But let's talk about the defensive end because he gets lazy. He doesn't run the floor. Warrior fans, I have to tell you this. There's times where he will dog it behind the play. 
And I think to lead by example, Draymond is probably going to have to turn up the defensive intensity, especially with Boogie, showing him like, yo, no, no, no plays off, no plays off. So look for Draymond to uh, be going harder earlier in the season. Now, my dark horse candidate, and this dude, to be fair, this isn't the dark horse, right? And it, it, it's Paul George. And Paul George was in the conversation last season. But I think what happened, as you saw Melo kind of fall off a cliff, and they had the injury to Roberson, right? And again, it matters. You have to have other good defenders on your team. Otherwise, it really, you can't stand out because it, there's too many leaking holes on the ship. Your ship's going to sink. It doesn't matter how good of a defender you are. And so when Roberson went out, Melo and, and all these things, they started to ask Paul George to do more offensively for that team as the season went on. And I thought he wore down a little bit. The acquisition of Schroeder, Nerland's Noel, I really like what OKC has done to their bench and their depth. I think it's going to allow Paul to focus more on the defensive end of the ball. And you want to talk about the separators for him. I think that he plays the passing lane arguably better than anybody in the league. And then he gets through screens very well. He, he, you forget that he's like six foot ten. I don't know if they list him six nine, six ten, but whether it's going under or going over, he is very agile, slips through, and is able to contest. And so I think that there's a good possibility he's going to be in that conversation as well. I'm trying to keep this under 20 minutes. Let's get into the MVP. Now, have you have you have you ever gone to a new job, a new school, right? There's that honeymoon phase. And we've talked about this so many times with different different things. And we, we saw that with Boston last year with Kyrie, right? You know, everybody wants to talk about Kyrie being, uh, oh, he proved he could lead. Well, that was the honeymoon. So let's see how Boston does this year where the egos have been built up a little bit more in their young players. But anyway, I'm not talking about that because that's not my favorite for MVP. My favorite for MVP is LeBron James. And I'm sorry, I don't want to be... Uh, I'm not going to just pick somebody just for the sake of it. I know this is the boring pick, but why I said this is, and, and I had him for last year, and he could have won it last year as well, and he, I'm just going with the odds if the favorite, right? And I just think that being in LA, celebrities courtside every night, this young roster, having to be more of a leader, and just magic, the expectations of LA, I know he's downplaying it right now, but he's going to feel it from opening night, and that's going to turn him up earlier on in the season. I don't think he's going to pace himself like we've seen through past seasons. One, because I think he also knows that they're probably not going. This is pro He's probably going to miss the finals this year. So what's he saving it for? So it's a lead by example thing. The spotlight, LA, the new digs, everything. I think we're going to see LeBron go hard from day one and uh, lead by example for these young Lakers. So he's going to have to be the, the favorite for MVP candidate. Now, uh, the candidate, the candidate, this one is a little bit of a dark horse surprise for you. I could, I could flip flop these candidate and dark horses, but my candidate is DeMar DeRozan. Now, now you're probably like, Al, you trip, you trip. Now follow me here. I have, I have, I have my reasons. I have my reasons. Now, San Antonio is, we've heard for years that, oh, you know, and people, was it KD? We've heard different people knock players within San Antonio system or knock them down a notch just because they're with San Antonio. It's like, oh, well, they make everybody look better within that system. LaMarcus well, Aldridge begs to differ. Now, he had a fine year last year, right? But not everybody is a fit. Well, DeMar DeRozan's a fit as far as character and personality goes because the knock on him in Toronto was he's not an alpha. He's not a lead dog. He's not a franchise guy. But he is he's he's a soldier. He's an all-star, perennial all-star, and he's a soldier, and he'll fit perfectly into that system. And the talk out of San Antonio this year is where's the shooting gonna go? You lose Danny Green, and obviously DeMar doesn't shoot the three ball. Every offseason we hear he's going to, and he doesn't. Well, there, if you talk to people around the league, and, and it's kind of uh, um, understood that no one develops shooters better than San Antonio. When Kawhi came into the league, he, he didn't really have a shot, and look at him now. And that's why you see them draft a DeJounte Murray, uh, the kid from uh, Miami or Florida, the Baxter kid this year, right? They'll draft an athlete and a guy that's high character and know that they will turn him into a shooter. And I say that to say this, DeMar DeRozan's going to shoot threes this year, and he's going to shoot them efficiently. And San Antonio is going to up him. He's going to be better, 
right? And then everybody kind of expects them to take a step back. So you're going to have the shock of them winning another 50 games. And it's like, oh, San Antonio is still hanging around. Look at Tamar DeRozan. And then the, the very last aspect of this that I think is very important is the psychological aspect of both DeMar and Pop feel scorned from this situation, right? DeMar was blindsided in the trade after being told that he was staying in Toronto. So that's the extra motivation and juice. And then Pop obviously feels some type of way about Kawhi wanting out. And so he's going to play on that with DeMar, and they're both going to be extra motivated and look for him to shoot the three, them to be over 50 wins, and DeMar's name in this MVP conversation. Now, wrapping this up, my dark horse, and again, the candidate and dark horse in this category could have flip-flopped here. And my dark horse is for the party people, Victor Oladipo. I'm going to have to edit that out. That was corny as hell. Victor Oladipo, Indiana Pacers. Now, <clears throat> if you notice, a lot of these guys on this list have the no days off mentality. And I, you know, in this the video that I lost, I had six man, I had all this, and maybe for patron, I'll I'll extend that out and give those picks out there. But just for this sake, I didn't my time constraint and all that, I had to do this. But Vic has the ultimate no days off mentality, meaning I talked about pacing himself, and obviously he's young enough where he can do that. You know, when he's in his 30s, he may not be able to do that. But we talked about Draymond pacing himself, LeBron pacing himself, and some of these more veteran stars understanding the grind of the season. But also, it's hardwired. Russell Westbrook, he'll, he, he'll never be able to pace himself because it's just a mentality. And, and Oladipo kind of cut from that cloth as far as how hard he plays all the time. Okay, And then I really like this Indiana roster. I really like this Indiana roster. What Oladipo did last season that really gave him that next step up, that next level to being a legit all-star was, he started to shoot the three ball off the dribble. He added that layer to his game. You combine that with the way he can get to the hoop and his explosiveness, it's just a, it's just a, a predicament for defenders because now he's coming at you full speed. He could pull up and you have to respect that. Now you're on your toes. He goes by you and he crams on you, right? It's a pick your poison thing. And the final piece to the puzzle, I think for Oladipo is, is to use his gravity to make other players better, you're right? He's, he's kind of become the full package offensively. So now use that gravity and become somewhat of a playmaker for this Indiana team that has a lot of young talent. I like the acquisition of Tyreek Evans. And then you've got their young, young players one year better with more experience. And I think that the real question will be, can Miles Turner take that next step to being an all-star? If Miles Turner can be his sidekick and they can have a duo of all-stars in Indiana, look for them to be the fourth seed in the East and Victor Oladipo is going to get that credit and be in the MVP conversation. Now, preseason starting, y'all. I'm going to cover around the league. You know I'll touch on the Warriors and do all that stuff. Check out the Patreon for the exclusive clips. I'll be back. Hit that like, share, and subscribe. I'm out, y'all. So long as like alchemy.